one of the things we've come to do to honor and proclaim the name of Jesus above all others this morning. Amen? Amen. Welcome to worship. We are so glad you're here. One of the ways we do that is we calibrate our hearts heavenward through Scripture. So you listen, you follow along, and let's, let's gaze heavenward as I read Psalm 108, 1 through 5. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing. I will sing praise even with my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples, and I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your loving kindness is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth. Thanks be to God. We gather today needing desperately to hear from the Lord. Amen? We gather today knowing that our families need to come and worship. We gather today as a corporate body recognizing to set aside time for worship is good. So we do this in community. So we take this time to stand up and just acknowledge those around us that we're here to worship together. We may be in this room. We may be at home. Welcome to worship. We are so glad you're with us today. God bless you. Wow, you're saying, wow, that's not Pastor Chris. You're right. You're right. Uh, if you're new with us today, my name is Danny Panter. I'm one of the associate pastors on staff. And what a joy it is to be a part of worshiping with you today and helping leading worship today. Senior Pastor Chris is across the way in Lagos. And what a sweet thing that we get to preach and lead you. And I'm so grateful that our Lagos congregation gets to have Pastor Chris this morning, so we rejoice in that. If you are new with us, whether you are in the room or at home, thank you so much uh, for gathering with us uh, in this space or at home. We just are overjoyed that you're gathering with us, and we would love to know that you're here. So um, you can either fill out the portion of the page on the back here, it says connect here, or even more, uh, more easily, you can go to the link that's on this page, and you can fill out that online. But we'd love to have a record of your visit with us today. We're so glad that you're here. Just to remind you, you already know this, we don't gather because God needs us to gather. We don't add to God's glory. He is infinitely glorious and true and beautiful, and His kingdom has no end. And Pastor Aaron has already alluded, we gather because we have need. Uh, we need our eyes opened. And so let's let that be our prayer today, that our eyes would be open to his son Jesus, that he would be our author and perfecter of our faith, that we continue steadfastly looking at him, and that we are reminded that it is his kingdom that is ever expanding and growing on this earth. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much. We do ask by your spirit that you help us see the things we need to see. Most importantly, your son. May he be exalted in this worship, in our lives and families and our work and our mission. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. We are tremendously grateful for all of our teaching pastors and so thankful that Pastor Danny gets to be with us today and we are, we are gonna be blessed, I guarantee it. Um, Pastor Danny did say early in the week, uh, if you've been with us for long, uh, Chris has been doing this kind of running calendar to kind of keep a track of how long we've been in quarantine in the pandemic. And Danny said, I'm not doing that. So it's day like 647 and week 82. It's something like that. You're just going to have to come back next week to get the, the accurate count. <laughs> Chris is the only one keeping track of that. All right. So you'll also notice, and uh, folks on TV can see this as well today, that, that we've added a little bit more to our decorations. Please be aware these are harvest trees, okay? So just in case you want to call them anything else, they are harvest trees for at least two more weeks, okay? <laughs> 
So here we go. Here's my question to you. Have you been in the Word this week? Have you taken time each day to open Scripture and let it speak to you? Me too. What a, what a joy, what a privilege it is. And at this point in, in the service, we calibrate our hearts to the Word, to what we've been reading together as a family. And, and so let me read this as an addition to our, our Philippians text. This is John 17, 14 through 19. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. Thanks be to God for his word. Our hymns today uh, remind us of our citizenship, our allegiance. One of the things, one of the phrases we've been reading all week that Paul's remind us, that we are citizens of heaven. So where's our foundation comes? It comes from Jesus Christ alone. So let's take this first hymn, wherever you are, at home or here in the room, take this hymn found in your worship bulletin. It's hymn 338, how firm a foundation. Let's worship. Well, good morning, kids. So if you're in the room, can, I, can you just wave at me real quick so I can see where you are? I see some hands. Oh, it's so good to see you. And if you're home, what a delight it is to be with you as well. We're so grateful that you're worshiping with us right at home. I think it's cool that we get to worship together in this space and families scattered all over the city. Now, I want you to take a look at this picture that you're going to see. <gasps> Oh my goodness. Now I know what you're thinking. He is so adorable. <laughs> right kids? You're like, look at that baby. Now you might not know this kiddos, but that is the uh, first page of a passport. I actually have it here. This is my first passport. I was born in France, so they issued me one really, really early on. And a passport is used to let other governments and countries know that when you travel into another country, that you are a citizen of the United States of America. So this is a, 
a U.S. passport. So everywhere I go, it lets other people know that I am an American citizen. Now, that's really cool. In this verse today, Paul says, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you trust Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, that you are a citizen of heaven, that you have a brand new citizenship. It's not an American citizenship. It's not a citizenship from another country, but as a brand new citizenship of heaven. Now, that is really cool. The promise of God is that when we follow Jesus, that we are locked in as his citizens, that we belong to him, and that we are a part of everything that he is doing. And so it didn't matter what country I was in or how long I lived in that country. I was always an American citizen. And in the same way as we live in this world, and it's not always easy, you can have confidence that you are always a citizen of the kingdom of God. God loves you and he holds on to you as you follow and love Jesus. That's good news that we are declared as citizens of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much um, that you call us sons and daughters, um, that we call each other brothers and sisters. And Lord, you also call us citizens of your kingdom, co-heirs with Jesus. And we thank you for that. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's kids said, amen. There was such wisdom in those eyes. It was, wow. What a perfect hymn to follow up that, that um, children's sermon. I know you're, you're, you're going to lean in as you hear Pastor Danny preach today. Now I belong to Jesus. Not for years of time alone, but for eternity. When he seals you with his, his promise, it's forever. Let's sing that. Stand together. Now I belong to Jesus. singing.
It was on that day when Jesus died on the cross, and three days later rose from the grave, that he sealed the eternal advancement of his kingdom, didn't he? That all of history, past, present, and future, would have everything to do with Jesus and his work and his kingdom. And that's what Paul would remind us of today, isn't it? So we've been in Philippians for 11 weeks. We have two more weeks after this one. And all along the way, uh, Paul has been inviting this little church in Philippi. Will you join me in this journey? Uh, will you joyfully and humbly traverse this earth, this side of eternity? And this is not a fluffy letter, is it? Um, we use that word joy. We know it's a, a deep abiding word, but it's, this has not been a fluffy letter. I mean, Paul has addressed his own suffering in, in prison. He has talked about suffering that the Philippian church is facing and will face. He has warned them about uh, people that would try to pull them away from faithfully following Jesus and trusting in the righteousness of Jesus. It's not a fluffy letter, but he has been saying, will you joyfully and humbly join me in this journey of faith? Uh, will you make Jesus the very epicenter of your life? Remember when Paul said, for me to live is Christ. He said, all of my life is about following and keeping my eyes on this Jesus who has secured me and has a promise for me, not just for me, but for us. Will you join me in that journey? Will you take those steps with me? Well, he's going to continue that refrain today 
as we work through uh, these few verses, verses 17 through 21 of chapter 3. Let's stand together and read these verses with one another. Paul writes, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see as we read these words of your servant Paul to this little church in Philippi. Lord, we pray as they resonated with them, as they reminded them, as they challenged them, that they would do the same with us. May we be faithful as your citizens. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. Paul, man, what an awesome guy. Don't you think just not a deep thinker, but a really, really sweet pastor to these people, even though from afar. And he continues this constant refrain of joining me. And he does it in a very poignant way today in verse 17 when he says, imitate me. Imitate me. He says, join in imitating me. And he even says, and I want you to keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have seen in us. Now, we know that Paul is not saying be righteous like me. I mean, let's be honest. When, when we read these verses without the other verses around it, we can get kind of squirmy, right? Paul is saying we should be like him. Shouldn't he be turning our eyes to Jesus, right? I mean, none of us would ever say that to anybody, right? Uh, we don't want to appear self-righteous. Oh, by the way, you should follow me in what I'm doing. But that's exactly what Paul does. But we know he's not pointing to his own righteousness. We know it because he tells us very clearly in verses 13 and 14. Remember, he says, I want you to know that I haven't arrived, uh, that I'm not perfect. Uh, I still have a ways to go. And he says, listen, but I know there's one thing that I do, and I want you to know what I do. He's kind of laying out his pattern of life. He says, I forget what lies behind, and I press on. I press on. And that's what he's inviting them to imitate. He's saying, I want you to do what I do in the hills and valleys of this life. Because until Jesus returns, you and I are going to still struggle with sin. Uh, you and I are going to still find ourselves facing uphill battles. We're going to find ourselves in suffering. We're going to be facing all kinds of things. And he's saying, I, I just want you to watch what I do when I face those things. I'm even in prison right now. Watch what I do. And when I stumble and fall, watch what I do. And so he's inviting them to watch that pattern in his life of forgetting what lies behind and pressing on towards the upward call in Christ Jesus. That's what he means. I want you to know how I live this life. I want you to watch how I traverse this terrain. Keep your eyes on me and I will show you by the grace of God how to live this life well, keeping our focus on the righteousness of Jesus rather than our own, trusting in the promise of God and moving forward. In fact, he says, not only do I want you to keep your eyes on me, but I want you to surround yourself with people who are keeping their eyes on me. I, I want you to be around people that will encourage you, not pull you down. Uh, I want you to be around people that will point you how to press on and forget what lies behind. Isn't that awesome? Uh, Paul is painting for us something that Jesus laid down a long time ago, even was very much a part of that rabbinic tradition. Remember what Jesus said when he first called his disciples? He said, come and follow me, right? And so Paul was just, just repeating that model. He was saying, I, I want you to follow me as I set my eyes on Jesus, and I, I want you to surround yourself with people that are following me and following Christ, 
This is an old, old tradition. It was discipleship. And so the question for us, just as an aside, is do you have someone who has ever invited you to follow them as they seek to follow Jesus in this life? Are you connected with people that you can follow because they're following Jesus? That's the model set for us for what discipleship looks like. And so I would love to encourage you, as Pastor Chris has encouraged us, into that kind of life of discipleship. I know it takes a lot of courage, but all you need to be is just a little head of the person next to you. But is there someone in your life that you can say, imitate me? Watch what happens when I fall and stumble. I'll show you what I do. Uh, Watch what happens when things get really tough for me. I'll show you what I do. Do you have someone that you can invite to watch, for them to watch you? And are you surrounding yourself with people who will do the same? I think it's a wonderful model. But that's not all that Paul says. Not only does he say, I want you to be like me, but he says, don't be like them. And who is them? Who is he talking about? In verse uh, 18, he says, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. I love the compassion of Paul. Um, These were people that were not aligned with Paul's mission, had a very different mission. Uh, And he describes them in in a moment as enemies of the cross. But he grieved, he grieved that they weren't walking as he was walking in faith in Jesus. A lot of compassion there. But he says, don't be like them. And who are they? He says, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. He describes them in a number of ways. But he says, don't be like them. First he says, don't be enemies of the cross like them. What does he mean by that? He says, these are people that had no need for the work of Jesus. Um, They puff themselves up with their own self-righteousness. Rather than pointed to to the cross and the work of Jesus and his righteousness, they said, oh, just look at us. We've got it all together because we follow the law or we do certain things and we have certain work. They were enemies of the cross because they did not point people to their deepest need, which would only be satisfied in Jesus. They were enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. And Paul would say, listen, people that have set themselves on that kind of path where they're not following Jesus, but they're trusting in their own righteousness. Their end is destruction. They remain as children of wrath. Uh, They are awaiting God's judgment. He says that's the kind of people that they are. That's where they're heading. That's the path that they have chosen for themselves. He says their God is their belly. He says, these are people that are governed by their most base, sin-riddled impulses. And they can't get enough. They pursue power, influence, wealth, attention, self-exaltation, and self-preservation. And like the dogs that he refers to before when he warns them about people, dogs just can't get enough. They're always looking for that next scrap of food, especially if you start feeding them from the table. It's a really bad idea. They're always just watching the floor. I mean, Gimli, our dog, is always, when we're, he's just watching. He's watching. They can't get enough. And he says, listen, these people are governed by their most base instincts and de- desires. It's their God. It rules them, and they can never get enough. And in fact, they even glory in their shame. They can't see it. They can't see it in themselves. And even though the the stench of their pride and self-righteousness is very evident to many, they can't get enough of the adulation of those caught in the black hole of their shame. They glory in it. Romans chapter 1 talks about those people who have walked away from God or rejected God and chose to worship the creature over the creator. And they walk around applauding people who are doing the same. They glory in their shame. And he says, don't be like them. Uh, Don't be ruled by your stomach and your most base desires. Don't be enemies of the cross. They've set their eyes on earthly things. He says, listen, these are people who are living for another kingdom entirely. 
a different set of values and purposes, and they're spending most of their energy accumulating temporary treasures and kingdoms. Don't remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6.20? Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy. Store up yourself treasures in heaven, right? I mean, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. These are people that were advancing and pursuing with much energy and gusto a completely different kingdom. And Paul says, don't be like them. Don't imitate them. Don't join them. Join me. Join me. Be different. Be different. I grew up in West Africa, and I lived in a particular neighborhood for a season of time in the capital city, Lome, Togo. The neighborhood was called the Site, and um, there was a home in that community. These were walled homes, but right beyond the wall in their front yard, um, this, this family had several green monkeys. It's a, a species of monkey and a little bush baby about this big and had a little, little bushy nose, super cute. Um, and we would often go and sit on the wall to be entertained by these monkeys. Now, the, the quickest way to get these monkeys distracted and focused on something was to have a very shiny object. Now, some of you probably have seen a similar analogy here, but monkeys really are captivated by shiny objects. And so we would take out a little coin, and the moment we took out the little coin, the eyes and attention of these green monkeys and little bush baby would be focused on that, that, that little shiny object, and they had to have it. Their world was captivated by this one little object, and they would do everything they can. They would come down and try to peel it out of your hands. The bush baby would just kind of crawl all over you, trying to get access to this little coin. And once they did, they would get this little coin and just kind of look over and just turn it over. They were completely unaware of what was going around them. They, would, they have little pouches in their mouth where they can store food. They would kind of put it in their mouth for a little bit and take it out and look at it again. Put it back in. And they, they were oblivious to everything else that was going on in the world around them. And oftentimes it would create a lot of turmoil because there was only one shiny object and you had to have it. Paul says, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Don't be enamored with kingdoms of the earth. Don't be enamored with shiny objects that lead to destruction. Don't be governed by your most base impulses and desires. Don't do that. Don't follow them. Stay away from destructive people, he'll say. Don't follow their path. So he says from the very beginning of this chapter, be like me. Don't be like them. And then he reminds us of the kind of people that we are and why we're to follow Paul as he follows Jesus, to watch what he does. And what does he say? He says in these next few verses, in verses 20 through 21, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now that is a loaded political statement, isn't it? That when Christ Jesus returns... We are going to be transformed. Paul would write in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15 in a twinkling of an eye. And we will watch Jesus subject all things to himself. Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That is a loaded, important, eternal, political statement. But Paul wants to remind us, you are citizens of heaven. Now, this had particular value and significance to the Philippian church because they really prided themselves in their own Roman citizenship. The, uh, Philippi was this small, uh, small Roman colony. And the citizens or the, uh, those who lived in this small town were given Roman citizenship and all the rights and privileges thereof. And so they prided themselves of being Romans. Paul says, you have a brand new citizenship. Your citizenship is in the kingdom of God. Remember that. You have greater loyalty that's demanded of you 
you are a citizen of heaven. Paul is being very literal and not metaphorical here. This is very important for us to know. Paul is not spiritualizing citizenship. He is talking about a very spiritual and physical reality that when Jesus returns, and even now his kingdom is expanding in all the earth and all the nations, he says, I want you to know that you aren't just a mystical, spiritual citizen. You are literally a citizen of the kingdom of God, citizen of heaven, that will be ushered in in all of its fullness when Christ returns. That's where your, that's where your heart belongs, your allegiance belongs. Uh, that's where your energy and passion belongs. And your loyalty belongs. You are citizens of heaven. Now, growing up as an MK, as I've already talked about, I had the privilege of uh, growing up in West Africa and, and uh, Germany and Belarus, lived in Russia for a period of time. I, just blessed by that experience. Um, but that whole time, I was an American citizen, even though I lived in these other countries. Uh, I would eat their food. I would try to understand and learn their language and culture. But it didn't matter how much I understood and how much I enjoyed the food and culture. I was always a citizen of the United States of America. And Paul is saying the same thing to us. On this side of eternity, uh, yes, I want you to seek the good of the city. I want you to know the language. I want you to know your neighbors. I want you to invest in the culture. I want you to enjoy the food. I want you to participate in what I'm doing in, in this earthly kingdom. But don't forget, your citizenship is somewhere else. You're a citizen of heaven. You're an alien in this world. Uh, you're an immigrant passing through to a better land. And what did Jesus say? Right before he went to the cross, he said, listen, Father, you've given me these men. I've poured myself into these men. I, I've spoken the truth. I've given them your word. Sanctify them in your word. Lord, may they be of my world as I'm of your world. Listen, they are not of this world, Jesus would say. They're not of this world. They're in the world, but not of the world. And that's what Paul is saying to us when he echoes those words of Jesus. You are citizens of heaven. You are not of this world. Set your sights and goals and values and purposes on, on a radically different kingdom. That's what he says to us. And what, really when we look at it, isn't Paul just striving to live like Jesus lived? To be like Jesus in the world, but not of the world. Listen, Paul wasn't waiting for Rome to get its political act together. Or for Jerusalem to finally shirk off Roman rule. He was, he was waiting for Jesus to come into his kingdom and finish what he started. Isn't that the promise of verse 21? That's what Paul says, listen, I can't wait to the day. And that's what he says, I am awaiting the day. Uh, that's, where, that's where Paul is focused. I'm awaiting the day that when Jesus comes in all of his glory, that I am transformed. I'm raised from the dead. And I'm a part of God's kingdom and his rule forever and ever and ever. You know, Jesus began his public ministry. Think about this for a moment. Jesus began his public ministry or campaign at 30 years old. He went to the cross at 33. He had three years. Three years to advance his kingdom. All along the way, at every turn, people tried to convince Jesus and expect Jesus to advance his kingdom by investing all of his energy and purpose in earthly kingdoms. All of them were awaiting for Jesus to undo and overthrow the Sanhedrin or maybe just put people in power that he really liked in the Sanhedrin. They were waiting for, for Jesus to muster up a large enough army and inspire the people in Jerusalem and across the land to oppose Roman rule. All of them were expecting him to step into a place of power to be king. He was king. He's always been king. But at every moment when those expectations were given to him, and in fact, they would say, we want you to do this. Will you do this? He said, what? No. That's not how I'm going to advance my kingdom. I'm not going to advance my kingdom 
by investing in earthly kingdoms. It's not the way I'm going to do it. He wouldn't have it. He didn't wrangle and lobby to put himself or others in places of power. He didn't protest the abuses of Rome or plot an uprising. He didn't try to get cozy with those who held places of power so that he could rise up the political ladder. It's almost as if Jesus said, you know, I just simply don't have enough time to go about it that way. I have three years. I'm going to do exactly what my father has told me to do. I'm going to set my face towards Jerusalem. What did he do? Well, we know ultimately Jesus went to the cross and rose from the grave, which would seal his kingdom, which would confirm his kingdom, uh, through which we have forgiveness and restoration and become citizens of heaven. But all along the way, even before he went to the cross, what did he do? He invested in the lives of 12 men. He gathered around 12 men and he said, I want you to come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He said, I'm going to advance my kingdom. Now watch me how I advance my kingdom. I'm going to pour myself into these 12 men. And when the time comes, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to unleash them on the world. And they're going to see in me, because they've seen it in me, how to love and follow the Father. And they're going to see in me how to bless and love their neighbor. And they're going to change everything by the Spirit and to the glory of God. He said, that's how I'm going to do it. Meekly and humbly, sacrificially, lovingly, powerfully. Paul says, you're a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. After all, we know Jesus knew what he was doing. After all, nations rise and fall, don't they? Nations rise and fall, but the kingdom of God is eternal. Now, I'm going to say some things that might be hard to hear from you, and I say them graciously. Um, One day, there will be no republic. There won't be Republicans or Democrats. There won't be conservative or liberal. There won't be the Supreme Court. There won't be Congress. One day the Constitution will burn up in fire. And if that doesn't sound like good news, we're in trouble. It doesn't matter, no more parliament across the way, no more communist parties and tyrants and dictators. All of it will be burned up in fire. And all that remains is the glorious, beautiful reign and kingdom of Jesus. Don't you long for that? That's what Paul is saying. Long for that. Pursue that. Listen to me just for a moment. What if, not just this church, but every church, not just we uh, family believers, but family believers all across the world, what if we invested our energy in advancing the kingdom of heaven? Rather than pouring all our energy and investment in the kingdoms of the earth, what if all of our strategizing and memes on social media and, and uh, conversations that we have with other people were filled not with the advancement of earthly kingdoms and policies and campaigns, but with the kingdom of God? Loving God and loving our neighbor. What would happen? Or what is happening? It changed the world. Paul says, don't forget that. Don't forget that. Don't forget your spiritual heritage, your citizenship. Don't get bogged down in other kingdoms and shiny things. Don't be distracted. Will you joyfully and humbly pursue the kingdom of God with me? Do what I do and surround yourself with people like that. Don't be like them. Be like me. Be like me. So here's the question. Where are you heading? Where are you heading? What kingdoms are you pursuing? Are you pursuing kingdoms of the earth? 
or are you pursuing the kingdom of heaven? Are you a joyful, humble traveler this side of eternity until Jesus comes? Setting your eyes and hope on Jesus and his kingship and his government and his righteousness, his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Paul and these words you inspired him to write. Lord, we need it today. Goodness gracious, we need it today. Lord, help us to be your people who have set our sights on your kingdom. Help us to long for King Jesus and his return. And until that day comes, may our tongues and words and deeds be clothed in the gospel. Help us to advance his kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. This is a time of response. You're going to stay seated and you're going to receive. Our expectation is that God is at work in all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, he's always at work in you. Will you respond today? Um, uh, this altar is still very much open. We can't touch you necessarily. We can pray over you. Uh, but if you need to repent of other kingdomness because your heart and mind has been set on an earthly kingdom and you want to say, Lord, I just, I need to get things right. This is the place and time for you. If you need to come to faith in Jesus for the very first time, this is the day for you. Trust in Jesus who died for your sin and rose from the grave where you can have forgiveness and restoration and a new citizenship. Will you come? Respond this morning.
may we faithfully seek God's kingdom this week together. It's good that we get to do that together. And hopefully you're continuing to make connections with brothers and sisters in Jesus that will remind you of that every single time you gather or speak to one another. But we are part of a movement. We are part of God's movement on this earth until he returns. And it's a joy to do it alongside one another. Um, These beautiful flowers are in memory of Lloyd Bingham. And we rejoice and always uh, in the opportunity to honor uh, those in our church family uh, through flowers. Just a few of the things I want to draw your attention to before we um, wrap our time of worship up together. The first is we are in a holiday season. Thanksgiving is just around the corner and then Christmas thereafter. And we have an amazing opportunity to love the city well. And hopefully you are already aware of our Thanksgiving food drive and delivery. We're continuing to receive donations to put those food items in boxes that will go uh, to families across our city. Um, But will um, you volunteer and be a part of what God is doing in that? I think we still have some opportunities uh, for delivery drivers and families actually can do that together. Um, But you can go online to get more details about that. Also, Christmas care. There are so many wonderful things in Christmas care. It's it's a season of giving, very literally, uh, in community missions. And so find a place where you you or your family can plug in and love the city in these particular ways. You can get details about all those ways online. um, But but let's be that kind of church uh, that loves our neighbors well. Pastor Aaron. Oh, sorry. Church family, this morning we have coming for membership Annetta Schofield by statement having received Christ and been baptized. So, you, let, let me do this. Uh, <laughs>